Good morning and welcome to this panel on America Divided. Uh, I'm David Gergen and I'm delighted to be here with such an outstanding panel. The morning after the election in the United States this past November, uh, many Americans woke up jubilant. They felt vindicated. Others woke up almost in mourning. Boston, where I live these days, citizens pride themselves on being the cradle of democracy. They represent, they, citizens have long celebrated the wisdom of the country. And in Boston, the cry went up, the people have spoken, the bastards. <laughs> <laughs> but as I say, in much of the country, there was celebration. Um, there are a couple of things I think we do know coming out of this election. One, it has, there is a sea change that has been underway in American politics, which this election advanced. In the 40 years uh, leading up to the elections of 1964, the Democrats won seven out of the 10 national elections. In the 40 years since then, Republicans have won 10, seven out of the 10 national elections for the presidency. The Republican Party, which was, and the conservatives in particular, who were in the wilderness back in the mid-60s have clawed their way back. Uh, and they have, uh, they're now in, much more in the saddle. The Democrat, it has been not since 1976, since 1976 has the Democratic Party won a majority of the white vote in America. I'm sorry, not since, not since 1964 have they won a majority of the white vote in America, not since 1976 have they won a majority of all the voters. We've had six congressional elections since 19. 94, the Democrats have not cracked 48.5% in any single election for Congress in the last six. There's a big change. And Republicans now believe that they have finally broken the deadlock and have moved to a modest advantage. And what they're ho hoping to build is a rolling, what's called a rolling realignment. That's one obvious change. The other obvious point about this election is that George W. Bush emerges from this election as someone who now I think is accepted as a formidable politician. Whatever you may say about his politics and his, and his policies, the fact is he's a very shrewd, able, and formidable politician. It's worth noting that in the past 100 years, only two men, two Republicans, have served two consecutive terms as pre American presidents, Dwight Eisenhower and Ronald Reagan. George W. Bush is now going to emerge as a third, and that is an accomplishment. So take him seriously, as he himself likes to say, he is often misunderestimated. <laughs> <clears throat> That's what we know. But there is much that we don't know, that we're still puzzling about in America, and that many of you from other nations are puzzling about as well, and that's what we're trying to get at today, and what the implications are both for our governance uh, within the United States and for America and America's role in the world. What do these divisions mean? How, how will it affect the United States? Uh, and how will it affect us overseas? Fortunately, we have a wonderful panel, as I said, on my far left, Senator Orrin Hatch, from Utah, a longtime member of the Senate, uh, and one who is respected on both sides of the aisle and has worked frequently uh, with Senator Kennedy and others on bipartisan legislation. He's a strong conservative, but one who's known as a principal conservative who works with others. To his right, uh, for the first time, uh, is Gavin Newsom, uh, the uh, young, energetic, innovative mayor of San Francisco. He is also among those who the uh, young global leaders here at Davos this year. Uh, we're delighted to have you here for your first session, sir. To my right is John Sweeney, the president of the AFL-CIO, uh, someone who now has become a, joining the ranks of the legendary labor leaders in the United States who has worked long and hard in the vineyards, uh, uh, sometimes successfully, sometimes not in terms of politics, uh, but he has certainly been a, pr a champion and principal of the causes of working people in the country. And to his right is Senator John McCain, uh, well known to most of you, uh, Republican, Arizona. Uh, he shares with Senator Hatch a, uh, an appeal that stretches beyond party. Uh, indeed, there, there are many who, who um, um, 
uh, think that had he gone on to win the Republican nomination four years ago, he would he would have won a sweeping victory uh, in his quest for the presidency. I think here that at least there are two men here who have run for the United States presidency. There are two men here who may still run for the United States presidency. Uh, there's one man who is president, and there's one, uh, Orrin Hatch, who was once a member of a labor union and would report to the president of the AFL-CIO, I believe that. It's good. So it's a, it's a terrific panel. So uh, let, let's start by what's, what is driving this divide between red and blue? What accounts for the election outcome and your judgment? What's the principal cause? And then I, I'd like to probe more deeply beyond uh, Senator Hatch. Well, uh, it's a pleasure to be on this panel with all these uh, fine people, and I know them all very well, except Gavin here. I just read about him an awful lot, and, uh, <laughs> and he's very controversial, as I, uh, I fully understand. In fact, he probably can explain some of the divides better than any of us. <laughs> Let me just say, it wasn't just partial mourning. There was a lot of mourning uh, on the election uh, by a lot of people, but there are a couple of things here that are very important. We have a representative form of government. We do not have a direct election of the president. We have a direct election by 50 states. It has worked marvelously well for us. Every state is in play. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the president won 51 to 48. Now that doesn't sound like much, but that was a major, major uh, win by the president in this last election, although some would think not. But there were some very interesting uh, statistics there. For instance, we now divide America in red states and blue states. Uh, red states being Republican, blue being Democrat. New Mexico, for instance, uh, you know, went for the president with 49.8% of the vote. It's a red state. Utah was 71.1%. Both of them are red. Uh, Montana, Nevada, Nebraska, Iowa, they elect both a Republican and a Democrat to the United States Senate, yet they're red states. Arkansas, West Virginia, North Dakota, they elect uh, two Democrats. It's a very strange situation if you think about it. Wisconsin now, a blue state, is 49.8% for John Kerry. New Mexico was 62.1%, both of them blue. But Oregon and Minnesota, both blue, they elected both a Republican and a Democrat to the United States Senate. Maine and Pennsylvania and New Hampshire, both blue, are all blue, elect two Republicans. As you can see, these are in, 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 they're inconsistent with what, uh, uh, what, what happens. I think, to answer your question, uh, Dave, uh, I believe that we're, we're having tremendous cultural issues, and there's a shift, for instance, on abortion. This is the first time I felt a slight shift on abortion in, 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 in our major elections in our, in our country. People are very concerned. I, I presume that that has come primarily from the fight over partial birth abortion, which to most people is a barbaric act, uh, unnecessary act. And people even the, uh, on the, on the pro-choice side of the equation are saying, uh, hey, we've got to stop and think. And then take uh, Mrs. Clinton just recently, uh, Senator Clinton gave a uh, speech that was very moderate with regard to abortion, although she did reaffirm her position on uh, abortion rights. Historically, uh, you know, Bush got 11% of the black vote. I think in the previous election was 8%. He got 44% of the Hispanic vote. If we get 40% of the Hispanic vote, the election's over as far as I can see. He, he got 40% last time. This was 40, I think, last time, 39 or 44%. 35. 40, was it 35? 35? I thought it was higher than that, but he got 44%, which is a ma massive growth in the Hispanic vote. Bush has done more to bring the people of diversity into his administration than any president I recall in my 28 years in the United States Senate. Now, I know I've talked too long, but uh, uh, these things are very important. Immigration has become a very dividing issue. And uh, some of the red states are differing with the president on immigration. Some of the blue states might agree with him more than uh, than some of the red states. These are just some of the divides that we have that are very disconcerting to, uh, uh, to anybody serving uh, in the country today. Thank you. And uh, Gavin, uh, moved much more in the cultural direction. You're there in the center of San Francisco. The United State of San Francisco. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way we interpret it. <laughs> right. And, you know, I confess, you know, I, I think the state 
analysis is an interesting one, but I think it's more interesting to look at this urban phenomenon, this coastal phenomenon, a community phenomenon. I mean, even in Texas, where Bush won by 61% of the vote, he lost most of the major cities. He lost most of the major urban centers, as he had throughout the United States. So I think it's more of a divide within states. Uh, that's why I think it's very important for the Democrats not to give up on the red states, to have a national agenda and look beyond just the generalizations that many of us are now trying to provide. Let's put this in perspective. The last two elections, 2000 and 2004, were the closest elections since the 1880s. We've won the plurality of votes in the last three out of four elections. Gore got more votes than George Bush. He just didn't get enough electoral votes. And obviously Clinton won election and won a, re, a, a new election, a re-election. That being said, there's clearly a problem within the party. We're losing congressional uh, seats and we're obviously losing a lot of the state seats, gubernatorial seats and the like. There were some bright spots. Colorado, a red state, is now almost disproportionately a blue state. And I think there's some interesting answers for the Democrats that why that turned around. But I think clearly the issues, culture, sure, are important. But this issue of moral values was so wildly overplayed, and it plays right in with respect to the Republicans on this panel, plays right into the Republican agenda. And I think the Democrats have an obligation to stand up and, dis and determine the obvious, and that is enunciate what the moral values are all about. Moral values are about peace. Social justice is a moral value. Uh, moral values don't necessarily, by definition, fall into the category of Republican strength. So I think the lessons uh, to be learned are we lost because of security. Uh, from the end of the day, that's what it's about. But it doesn't mean that Democrats get off the hook, because a lot of people see us as dovish, a lot of people see us as secular, and those are things I think the Democratic Party needs to address if we're going to get the majority. Gavin, you know I can't leave it there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Please don't. The, 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 the issue of gay marriage okay. is one that's an in issue. which, in, it, in, well, there were uh, ballots for, on gay marriage in 11 states. They all, prohibitions against gay marriage passed mm -hmm. in all 11 states, including the quite Oregon. liberal state of Oregon. Yeah. Uh, and you obviously were involved in the gay marriage issue in, in San Francisco in which you uh, granted licenses to a great number of people and others have said that was a symbol that set off uh, a chain reaction and that a state as pivotal as Ohio the outcome turned on the gay marriage issue. Do you reject that analysis? Well, I do reject it because I think when we took a deep breath after everyone jumped up and down, Bill Bennett said it was decided on these issues, ethical and moral values, minutes before uh, President Kerry conceded the speech and all the pundits said this is it because they're looking for something fresh and new. The reality is quite different. I mean, the fact is there was no significant increase in support for George Bush compared to 2000 in any of those 11 states. I mean, he won, he did better in 45 out of 50 50 states, including New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. It wasn't just the Bible Belt states. No doubt in my mind, when the Senator brought up African-American vote, I think the African-American vote reflected concern about gay marriage. No question in my mind. And that's a point of some concern for me and others. Gay marriage did have an effect, it turned out undoubtedly, but to me at the end of the day, it wasn't a deciding factor uh, in Ohio and it wasn't a deciding factor across the country. Now, okay. others may disagree with me. Well, I, I just, for the record, want to say that uh, the, the, in Ohio, the largest city in Ohio these days is not Cleveland, but Columbus. Uh, it's past Cleveland in size. The, Columbus has a black Democratic mayor who did a very energetic job, job got the turnout way up in all the cities in, uh, in Ohio, including Columbus. Uh, he has told me personally he believes the gay marriage issue beat him in Ohio. Uh, that it brought the vote out in the rural areas in ways that were unexpected uh, yeah. and it overwhelmed what he was trying to do in the cities. Uh, so I, I just, I do think there are di yeah. diff differing opinions on that, even among mayors. But even Mayor Coleman, I, I just was with him last week, he's starting to evolve on this as well. And uh, so, you know, respecting your conversation, I, I think a lot of us, that was an initial reaction. My party turned on me. Good luck getting a call back from any of the leadership in my party. You think I'm, you know, I'm spending more time with Republicans now, go figure, <laughs> than I am members of my own party. Uh, <laughs> Because th that was their initial reaction, but some of the more thoughtful ones are coming around to realize it might not necessarily have been the case. John Sweeney, uh, I'm, I I'm curious what's happening to working people. It, it is traditionally, conventional wisdom and the traditions have held that working people vote their pocketbooks. And that has been a mainstay for the Democratic Party. Uh, there, is a, there is a view emerging now that religion trumps class or economics in the voting habits of Americans at the presidential level. 
Is that your view? Well, I think that uh, there has been a lot said uh, about America being uh, deeply divided. Um, in some ways, uh, that's true. And as Gavin has said, uh, there is a clearly, clearly a, a, a cultural gulf between urban and rural voters as one example. Um, but too much has been made of President Bush's very narrow victory. Barely three years after September 11th, with American troops still engaged in Iraq and Afghanistan. This was not an election that created a new ruling conservative majority. And the president has no mandate for the radical domestic agenda that he has been announcing. And it's important to understand this when we're talking about division in our country. While a narrow majority of Americans voted to stand up with the president who led the response to September 11th, most Americans are deeply skeptical of his proposed assault on basic security, his effort to privatize Social Security, cut taxes on the wealthy, slash investments in schools and hospitals and health care, and roll back environmental protections, as well as free corporations from accountability, and pack the courts with ideologues intent on rolling back the rights of women and many others in our country. The president has no mandate from the voters who returned him to office for these policies. And alarms about the rise of the right-wing fundamentalist voters are greatly exaggerated. Most Americans share the ideas that many of you have here in this room. They favor cooperating with our allies. They support the United Nations. Majorities of Americans express doubts about the president's handling of our foreign policy, our economic policy, the war in Iraq. Americans are more diverse and they're more tolerant. And I think that the elections do show uh, an America divided. And a lot has been said about America being divided. But I think that we have to remember that the president campaigned with the most negative campaign by an incumbent president in our memory. The president won re-election by wrapping himself in the flag, appealing religiously, so to speak, to his own base, and running a savage attack on the character of his opponent, John Kerry. By setting up a contrast between his supposed strong leadership and his opponent's supposed flip-flop, he managed to avoid judgment on his failed policies. Under America's divide is the reality of working families who are losing ground. Despite all the attack and all the talk of U.S. prosperity, working Americans are losing ground. Wages aren't keeping up with, co with the cost of living. Good jobs are leaving our country. New jobs often don't have the pay or the benefits of those that are gone. Health care is broken with millions unable to afford adequate insurance. College costs are soaring. The old pensions are disappearing with record personal debts. And this causes deep insecurity. On top of this, I think Americans are, are rightly angry. David, you asked for what workers think. Right. And you're going to get it. I, I didn't necessarily need everything they think. <laughs> you haven't heard it all yet. Yeah. <laughs> and I think really that these are not, you know, about the red states and the blue states, because these issues are important issues in all the states around the country. And they're shared by those who voted for George Bush, as well as those who voted for John Kerry. Let me come back to you and just push this one more time, if I might. Here's, here's what I don't understand. In elections past, people who were unemployed, people who lived in, in, in near cities who were hard-pressed economically tended to vote Democratic. That was the best indicator of how they were going to vote, was their economic condition. Today, the best predictor, in the last two national elections, the best predictor of how people are going to vote for president has been how often they go to church or synagogue, especially church. If they're regular churchgoers, they vote very heavily 
Republican. And if they're infrequent or more, much more secular, they vote very heavily Democratic. Religion has become a much more important predictor of outcome than the economy, and I'm trying to figure out why that is. Well, I think that there's no question about it that, um, that uh, the values issues uh, were important in this election. But I also think that the national security and uh, security of our country as well as the war in Iraq, uh, Americans have a tendency to re-elect in the middle of a war the incumbent president, and I think that we saw a lot of this in this particular election. But there's no question that we have to uh, pay more attention to uh, the values issues of, uh, of citizens all across this country. And we in the labor movement, among our 13 million members, we see the diversity on, on these issues as well and how important they are. And yet we had the best turnout that we've ever had in any election. Uh, and 67, 68% of our members voted for John Kerry. We have approximately 25 or 27 percent that are registered Republicans and a small percentage that are independent, and a significant number of them voted for George Bush. But um, there just wasn't enough to, uh, to elect John Kerry. Thank you. Uh, Senator McCain, I, I don't know anyone in American politics today who has a better sense of the American voter because you've exposed yourself, you've been out talking to people all over the country on a regular basis, and you've got a very just sharp perception of what's happening. How do you interpret the divisions? If I'm so, if I'm so sharp, how did I lose? <laughs> uh, well, you learned the, a lot, probably. I did. Right? I did, and uh, as you know, there were some rumors about being offered the vice presidency during this campaign, and I was on, I think it was Jay Leno, and he asked me about it, and I said, you know, I spent all those years in a North Vietnamese prison camp, kept in the dark, fed scraps. Why the hell would I want to do that all over again? <laughs> uh, they, so, uh, uh, yeah. uh, since we're going so well, could I ask for your sympathy <laughs> for the families of Arizona? Because Barry Goldwater from Arizona ran for President of the United States, Morris Udall from Arizona ran for President of the United States, Bruce Babbitt from Arizona ran for President of the United States, I from Arizona ran for President of the United States. Arizona may be the only state in America where mothers don't tell their children that someday they can grow up and be <laughs> President of the United States. <laughs> I believe, I, I believe that, that for most voters, the presidential election came down to one preeminent issue, and that's the war on terror. And I think it's not inappropriate that that, that was the way uh, that this election was decided. It is clearly, at least in the minds of Americans, if not Europeans, that the preeminent threat to our future and our security. I, I think Warren's numbers are, are wealth, worth thinking about. We're not divided sharply into red and blue. There were some of these states were carried by a very small percentage. Some of them, as he mentioned, by a very large percentage. But this election, I believe, was won by President Bush at the Republican convention, where we were able to frame the debate about the election on the war on terror. And in the Democrat uh, convention, there was really no message. You know, we politicians like to believe that our constituents pay attention to us all the time. They don't. There are a few times where a lot of Americans tune in, and one of them is our party's conventions. And I believe that the, the message was clear and crisp that, this nation, that our nation faces a clear and present danger, and George W. Bush was most qualified to handle that issue. Of course there's moral values. I think there's always a certain amount of moral values. That's, that's part and parcel of our, uh, of our American way of life. And yes, people who grow to, go to church are more conservative than, uh, m most of the time, certainly in the right, when you see the rise of the evangelical movement uh, in the United States. But I reject this, this attitude, this belief that Americans are at each other's throats. Uh, people still invite uh, their neighbors over to, for dinner and don't ask their party registration. Uh, they're not in continuous uh, debates and fights over the deficit. Uh, you know, most Americans, like most Europeans, just go about their daily lives. 
But I also, and also, we have a strong partisan differences and bitterness in Washington. You just saw it in the fight over the confirmation of Condi Rice as uh, Secretary of State. We are seeing it now with uh, Gonzalez as the, uh, there was just a partisan vote in Orrin Hatch's committee on, uh, uh, for his confirmation of Mr. Gonzalez as Attorney General of the United States. But I don't think that that's true throughout the rest of the country. I, I'd just like to make w one other point, and that is that our nation is changing dynamically, the United States is. I come from the fastest growing part of our nation. Our population over the last 30 years has doubled and redoubled and redoubled. And you know where that growth is? It's primarily in the Hispanic voter. And that's true now not only in the Southwest, but around the country. Uh, George Bush got 44%, uh, I think something like that, or, uh, of the Hispanic vote. The key to the Hispanic vote will be the same as the key to the Irish vote in Boston and was the key to the McKinley regaining domination for the Republican Party in the early part of the last century. And Theodore Ro and Franklin Delano Roosevelt regaining predominance is how we treat the issue of immigration. Because people care about whether their countrymen are able to enter the United States of America. And right now, I believe, far more than Social Security, the issue of immigration uh, legal, illegal is a, is, a, is a primary issue. And the rise of the Hispanic voter in the United States will be a major determinant as to the outcome of future elections. And finally, let me remind you, I was around in 1994 when there was so much hubris on the part of the Democratic Party and thanks to Newt Gingrich uh, and a contract with America, we overthrew the Democratic Party. When I came to the House of Representatives, there was no way we were ever going to. So parties grow complacent, and I fear that maybe to some degree Republicans may grow complacent if we don't look out. But it's also healthy in America for the pendulum to swing back and forth. But again, I'd like to repeat my comment. I don't think that Americans are bitterly divided. I think that we are unified in our, war on, our commitment to the war on terror. I think we're unified in many other issues, and I think that just because we fight with each other all the time in Washington doesn't mean that Americans uh, do the same thing. Let me, let, let me ask. <clears throat> Senator Kane, let me ask you and Senator Hatch basically the same question, and that is about the middle uh, and whether there's a disappearing middle. Uh, it, it, it's well understood now that Karl Rove, as the president's uh, a political advisor, uh, has decided that American politics fundamentally changed, that for many, many years, the way you ran for president was you went to, your, to the base of your party, you either went left or went right during the primaries, and then during, and during the general election, you went to the center because that's where the, there were 20% of the electorate that, that remained open and, and, and gettable in the middle. There was sort of wavering middle, and that's how you won the election, and so candidates tended to run toward the center. Rove's view is that the center has splintered, it's disappeared, it's shrunk down to 7 or 8%. And so the way you win the election is you not only go to your base to win the primaries, but you go back to your base to win the election. And you, you get your base out, and that's the way you beat the other side, which means you get a more polarized and people running more to the edges than toward the center. Sure. And, and, the, and the question becomes, has that, is the center disappearing, and is that also reflected in congressional politics? So as you look around the Senate, look, look around the House in particular, whether the center seems to be disappearing and makes it harder to govern? Well, first of all, I, th I, I believe that the reason why you see uh, the congressional partisanship is because everybody practically has a safe seat now. It's harder to keep your seat in the Politburo in Havana today than it is in the United States House of Representatives. So um, I, I, th I think we've got a problem with, with the redistricting problem that people basically are, are, are there for life. But I, and I can't argue with success. Karl Rove won, and, and, and his strategy won. But I would argue that that was because the issue was framed about the war on terror. The independent voter registration goes up dramatically in, uh, in America. Ten years ago in Arizona, 5% of the voters were independent. Today, 26% of the voters are, 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 are independent voters. The state of Maine, overwhelmingly, the, uh, are, are independent voters. More and more people are registering independent. Does that mean they're truly independent? No, they lean one way or the other. But it also shows a frustration 
with the present system why people would would vote uh, it, it would register as independent. So, yeah, he won, and that was his strategy. You described his strategy to a T. But I believe that there is a rising number of Americans who are not closely aligned uh, with either party. Perfect. Senator Hatch, the, the, the middle, is there, is, is there sort of a, a large middle out there now, or are people sort of now dividing up and moving toward one or the other side, especially in the Congress? I just say that Carl, Carl Rove uh, was educated in Utah, so you can blame Utah for, <laughs> for the leadership, but, but he's, he's a remarkably uh, a decent, honorable, prescient uh, young man still and did a terrific job for this president. But we're much more divided. Let me just speak of the U.S. Senate, in the U.S. Senate than, than the country is. Uh, it's very much polarized. Uh, in the last, uh, uh, in, in before this last election, we only had maybe two or three Democrats who would even consider voting with us on some issues. For the first time in history, we had had Democrats, or anybody, filibustering uh, Circuit Court of Appeals nominees. Uh, that's never happened before. Now, there have been cloture votes before, but they were used to, for management, uh, floor management purposes. It's caused a tremendous division uh, between Democrats and Republicans, and it's a very dangerous thing to do, as you can imagine. Once they hit the floor, they ought to have a vote up and down. Uh, in the new Senate, it's just as polarized as before. Now, I have to say, we always have uh, five or six Republicans who are more moderate uh, to liberal. Uh, it'll surprise you to know that I, uh, some people in Utah think I'm the more liberal senator from Utah, and <laughs> even though uh, I'm known as a conservative uh, everywhere else in the country. But there, there, is a, there, there, there are divisions even within the Republican Party where some are so far to the right that John and I have a rough time uh, identifying. Uh, with uh, the extreme uh, parts of the right. That's interesting. If they come mostly up through the House and then into the Senate, these new, more extreme... Well, I have to say the Senate has become more conservative uh, from a Republican standpoint, more liberal from a Democrat standpoint. But I don't think the country... I think John is right, there, and uh, you're right. There is a growing uh, independent uh, group of people in our country, but all of these issues are important. The cultural issues, uh, for the first time, I've really seen them start to make a difference. The religious issues. We're a religious nation, regardless of what anybody thinks. We're not a fanatically religious nation. I remember speaking with the uh, French uh, foreign minister one time, and we were raising some religious issues, and he said, you know, in France, he said, with our history, we have to protect government from religion. He said, you're exactly the opposite. In America, you have to protect religion from government. Uh, it's important. The abortion issue has become a very polarizing, important issue. Same-sex marriage. Forty-two states have adopted the Defense of Marriage Act, uh, either that or something very close to it, very upset about trying to change the traditional definition of marriage. And yet within that, uh, within that, within, I think, the vast majority of people in this country, there's a real concern about being fair uh, to gay people and not, being dis uh, not having discrimination against gay people. It's an odd dichotomy on immigration. If you're in California, there's a real different attitude in California and Arizona and Texas and Florida than there may be in Utah and some of the interior states. It's a, it's a very, very polarizing, difficult issue. But I think one of the things that has caused us the most polarizing uh, of all happens to be the filibustering of, of judges. Because, and, and the actions of judicial activists, whether from the right or from the left, neither should take place, uh, rather than being judges who interpret the laws instead of making the laws. And that has caused a tremendous furor in the, in the United States Senate, in the Congress, throughout the country, and judges have been making laws that the people have no say in. And that's where we're having a lot of difficulty, and I think that's played a big role. The gun control issues. I re we, we won West Virginia in, in, in the year 2000, and I think it was primarily because union workers were sick and tired of being told that, uh, that uh, uh, they shouldn't have a right to keep and bear arms. It's a, it's a right that, that, that polarizes America, but it's one that uh, the majority of Americans don't like to have explicit rights in the Constitution taken away from them. So 
there are a lot of, lot of issues here that are, are very, very important people, uh, very important uh, uh, issues. And I agree with John. Uh, John, uh, John ran a terrific campaign in the year 2000. Uh, he is very well respected in our country, in the Senate. And, uh, and frankly, uh, I, do, I do think he has his ear to the ground with regard to people throughout our country. And, and I'm, trying to, I'm trying to learn from him. <laughs> yeah. Slow uh, learner, but I'm trying. <laughs> uh, yeah. Senator McCain, you had a brief. Just one, one brief comment. Let's, let's also give credit to the campaigns matter. Campaigns oh, yeah. matter. Yeah, I agree with that. And the Bush campaign was disciplined and effective to a T. They ran as close as you could have to a perfect campaign. And that, we, we have a tendency to forget that. Uh, and the Kerry campaign was not disciplined. I mean, you can read the Newsweek uh, book uh, about it. But I love my friend Oren, but if I walked down the street in Phoenix and stopped an average citizen and said, what do you think about filibustering judges? He'd say, what? <laughs> I agree with that. My, my, my constituents don't know anything about filibustering of judges. Now, if I asked them, what's your top issue? They'll tell you Ill illegal immigration because of the devastation that it's, that it's inflicting on, on my state. So sometimes in Washington, we have a tendency to think that priorities are not exactly what I think sometimes our constituents are. Dave, Dave could I just right comment? Here, uh, <laughs> let me tell you, as somebody who's dealt with that for 28 years, uh, he's right. And the average person doesn't think of that, but they hear about it. And there's an aura that covers America saying there's something wrong here. One third of the separated powers of government is being mistreated. And it's being mistreated for partisan purposes. Now, one point I'd like to make. I agree with John. The real great issue in this last campaign was national security, was anti-terrorism. It was the fear that we're going to have to put up with more 9-11s. It's a worry that the Western world, if we don't wake up, is going to have tremendous difficulties. France has 10 percent Muslim pop population. Many of these young kids in that population will not watch French television, but they listen to Al Jazeera. And they pay attention to that. And they're getting a, a, a tremendously different, a different approach. With regard to John Kerry, I was absolutely astounded he did as well as he did. Honest to goodness, I was. He did very, very well. But that also shows, in my view, that the nation is polarized. Because I couldn't, I, when I heard that uh, a senator from Massachusetts is going to run for president, is going to be their nominee, I thought, my gosh, that's a wonderful benefit for us. But it was a close election in that sense. I have to say that, that I'm very concerned about our country. Uh, I, I, believe that, uh, I believe that we've got to resolve some of these difficulties uh, that are between Republicans and Democrats, independents, the far right, far left. Kind of the far right and far left, they, they, they basically exclude themselves in the process sometimes. But, it was national security, and people just didn't believe that John Kerry really was going to be the person who would protect our nation and the Western world as we need to be protected from these radical Islamist fascists. It's just that simple. Thank you. I'm mindful of the time and the fact that uh, Senator McCain uh, needs to be excused around 12.15 in just a few minutes, and we also want to get to the floor. There are many issues that we could talk about, but there's let me just get to the foreign policy question and about what this election meant and what American politics means for foreign policy. There are many in Europe, as all of you know, who in, who've interpreted it before the election. They said, well, we love America and, and we just don't like George W. Bush's policies, and, but we don't think they represent America. And then along comes the vote, and indeed he wins by a substantial, he wins a substantial vote. Now, the question becomes, was the vote a vote which, in effect, endorsed his foreign policy, including the war in Iraq, which he has said it was? Or was it not the position that President Clinton took here yesterday? In other words, how should Europeans interpret this vote? This is the, that, that's the first issue. How should Europeans and others outside the country interpret the vote in terms of foreign policy? Secondly, looking ahead, how much patience is the American people going to have, are they going to have to stay the course in Iraq after the war is over? And thirdly, brief on each one, is there an appetite, would the public be willing to support military action in Iran? I think those three questions are hanging out here 
for a lot of people in Davos. And if you could be brief on each one, John Sweeney, why don't we start with you just very briefly? Well, I think that uh, many of us who were really urging the president to, uh, uh, to hold off on going to war and to uh, exhaust the diplomatic uh, um, relationships and, and build those relationships even stronger with our allies, as well as continue through the UN process, once war was declared, uh, it was our, uh, the members, in our case, the members of our unions, it was the children and the grandchildren of so many of our workers and who were over there fighting the war. And uh, I think that most of the people supported the, uh, the war effort and have continued to support the war effort. And uh, while there may be questions and while there may be uh, some points of disagreement, um, basically uh, the support is there for the war. And there's certainly, I think, going to be strong support for the reconstruction and what's going to be necessary to rebuild Iraq after the war, uh, as we are doing, uh, starting to do in Afghanistan. In terms of Iran, um, I'm not sure about Iran. I'd like to get us out of Iraq first and then talk a little bit about Iran. Um, if I could just go back for a second sure. to the middle. Um, I agree with what has been said here in terms of, uh, of um, the kind of campaign that the Republicans uh, waged in terms of uh, discipline and so on, but I also think it was a very negative campaign. But those of you who were at the plenary last night when President Bill Clinton spoke and uh, towards the end of his, uh, his conversation, he um, talked briefly about the fact that um, the Republicans uh, won the election. Um, they obviously must have done a better job on message and on uh, some of the techniques of the campaign. But now it was the Democrats' uh, opportunity to rebuild their party and to go out and, uh, and uh, work on uh, what they need in terms of the next election. Um, and I think that that's what we have to be focused on. But believe me, President Bush didn't win this election on a conservative agenda. He didn't win this election among, certainly not among middle class and working people uh, on uh, what he was planning to do in privatizing Social Security or what he was going to do in terms of tax policy or what he was going to do in terms of continuing to slash social programs and programs that workers uh, find so important to them and to their families. And I think that's the mistake that they're making in terms of the direction they're going with conservative domestic policy. Thank you. Uh, Gavin Newsom, from a California West Coast perspective, view on the foreign policy, how, what people should read into it overseas? Well, at, at peril of, of being uh, you know, beaten to pulp by the two superior intellects on my right, left, and center, uh, I think the war in Iraq is a disgrace. I think it's an abomination. Uh, the idea that... And, the idea that we are about to have spent $300 plus billion dollars in Afghanistan and Iraq when we've got a country with 35, almost 36 million Americans in poverty, those are families of four earning, families of four earning gross income of $18,810. When you've got a country that lost another 1.4 million Americans to the roles of the uninsured, now 45 million Americans uninsured, at a time when we're asking no sacrifice from the wealthiest of the wealthy, and we're rebuilding schools in Iraq, but we can't rebuild schools in America, I think it goes to real national concern, security concern. I think, and I respect Senator McCain as much or more than any Democrat, the reality is I think we're extraordinarily divided in this country. The parties have, I think, never been more divided. Accordingly, I've got friends that no longer are friends of Republicans and vice versa because people are stopping in the streets and they are upset and they are fed up. I like the optimism and I appreciate the fact that there is a common humanity in America, but we are divided. And I think the message is you should know that. By no means do I believe that the majority of Americans are endorsing the foreign policy of this president, but I agree as well, again, with Senator McCain, that there are a lot of anxious voters out there, and they were looking for strength and constancy and resolve. The flip-flopping argument they did to Kerry was devastating. It was bigger than the issue of his record in the Senate. It was a time of uncertainty where we want certainty. And if you want certainty, 
George Bush is your guy. I had Democrats that voted for him because he was resolved. He sees the world as black and white, good and evil, the excess of evil. Democrats tend to see the gradations. But in time of uncertainty, war on terrorism, we want that person in there that's got that resolve and sees no gradations. So I think that's, at the end of the day, the message. But I don't believe it's an endorsement uh, of this foreign policy of the president. We Just quickly. In the past, we've always been able, in, t in times of war, we've always been able to balance the needs in terms of defending our country, but also to address the needs of the people in our country on domestic policy. And during a war you, is the wrong time to wipe out a surplus in your uh, federal treasury and to wipe out uh, taxes uh, that are so necessary if you're going to protect your citizens at home as well as live up to your international commitments. Thank you. Senator McCain, I know you're going to have to leave shortly, so let's make this your last, if we might. I, I, people overseas are really trying to help uh, to understand what did this election mean about Americans the majority of Americans view toward Iraq, whether they're going to stay the course and whether they would be willing to see, in the event diplomacy does not work, whether they'd be willing to see military action in Iran. Um, I'd like to remind you that the 1992 campaign, the slogan was, it's the economy stupid. Every presidential campaign since 1952 when we were in the Korean War is based on the economy. This election was based on the war on terror. And that's where President Bush gained uh, his, uh, I think, uh, advantage. Many Americans viewed the war on terrorism and the war in Iraq as the same. A majority of viewers of Fox News believed that, that the both were inextricably uh, tied. On the issue of Iran, I think we have a big problem now that's got to be resolved, and that is the failure of our intelligence and every other Western nation's intelligence that had decided that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. So I think we would have a greater job of convincing the American people if we are basing it on uh, the, in a military action, basing it on um, as a rationale for taking military action uh, against Iran. There's um, justifiable skepticism out there now because uh, we have found that there are no weapons of mass destruction uh, in Iraq at this time. So do you think the United States, uh, Senator Kennedy yesterday called for a pullout now uh, from Iraq. Is he a lone voice? Do you think the United States Senate is going to support the president in, for an indefinite stay as long until the troops get trained in Iraq to stay in Iraq? And then would the Senate be willing, or will the Senate say, go really slow in Iran? How will the Senate come out on the, uh, that? Well, f first of all, I, I would hope that our European friends, including those who just applauded the remarks about Iraq, would recognize that that decision was made by the United States. And it is now of vital importance that we all work together to try to bring democracy to Iraq. If we fail in Iraq, the consequences will not only be borne by the United States of America, but it will every other nation in the world because of what Iraq will turn into. So uh, I, I am uh, convinced that we have to succeed. And we'll know fairly soon with these elections uh, coming up on Sunday as to, uh, as to what the, the trend is. Um, but. I think the consequences of failure in Iraq now would have significant negative effects on, on the entire world. Senator McCain, thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you for having okay. me. Senator Hatch, we'll turn to you, and then we're going to go to the floor. And uh, the, our organizers have uh, suggested we stay till 12.30. We're going to let you out at 12, 12.30 sharp. We'll be over. Senator Hatch. Well, there is a lot of, tre there is a lot of trepidation. <laughs> Excuse me. There is a lot of trepidation with regard to Iraq. We're all concerned about it. On the other hand, what do we do? Just sit back and do nothing uh, to a dictator whose only change of, uh, a a of approach to life is if you put the pressure on him. And frankly, uh, what we found in Iraq is, is so devastating to anybody who cares about human rights, morality, decency, and honor that uh, whether you're against that war or not, 
you've got to say, my gosh, that regime did not deserve to continue to dominate that really very important country. Uh, I might add that uh, now that we're there, it's a very important fight, and we need to succeed. Now, I'm not as sure as others that we're going to have a, a progress to democracy, but we do want a progress towards a representative form of government, and there's a chance that we might be able to get there. I look at the success in Afghanistan. We were just as criticized for going into Afghanistan. You're looking at a person who played a tremendous role as a member of the uh, Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. I'm still ranking member on that, uh, on that committee in helping to bring about the end of the Afghan war. I was right in the middle of all of that. It was all top secret stuff. Uh, there were so many other things that I've been involved with. With regard to Iran, uh, let's just be honest about it. There's a new generation rising in Iran that is very pro-Western. And that's what all of our intelligence is telling us, and that's what the young people are saying over there. They're tired of theocratic rule in Iran, and they're hopeful that they can change it. But you're not going to change it by wishing that it'll go away. Uh, some of our friends in, in France uh, can recall that when the Bosnian situation erupted, at first, uh, you know, we... Uh, we uh, we're not going to get rid of the embargo on, on arms. We uh, waited until the, the Serbs just uh, devastated whole areas of that place, and then all of a sudden we came in. Today, the French are the lead, have the lead role in Kosovo. It's a very interesting uh, phenomenon to me. Uh, if we don't stand up in some of these areas, and, and let me tell you, I think Europe is in much greater danger from terrorism than even the United States, as dangerous as it is for us. And I'm right in the middle of all of the, uh, all of the uh, law enforcement and other matters with regard to stopping terrorism in our country. You just look at the editorial in the Wall Street Journal today talking about all of the problems and all of the things that are going on with regard to terrorism in Europe. Uh, one uh, intellectual said that it's much more likely that we would have a major catastrophe in London than we will in the United States of America. Now, we thought 9-11 was a major catastrophe, and it was. It awakened us, and I think it ought to awaken the whole world, the Madrid bombings. They're having lots of trouble in Spain. There is a continual rise of Islamist fascists, fascists throughout Europe, especially in France, some in England. I think we've all got to wake up. You know, our interests are the same. The Western interests are the same. And our enemies are the same. And if we just sit back and say we, we're not going to do anything about it. My friend, uh, can I make one other point? My friend uh, John Sweeney, he's my union leader. I was a member of the AFL-CIO, worked in construction trade union for 10 years. Uh, and frankly, I'm very proud of it. One of the greatest men I ever met in my life, in all of my public life, was the international vice president of the AFL-CIO, and his name was Irving Brown, our leader of the tripartite delegation at Geneva at the International Labor Organization. He's the one that stopped the French docs from going communist. He fought communism from all over the world. He did more to defeat communism, in my opinion, than any other political world leader. And frankly, he was the inspiration behind the National Endowment for Democracy, where we put up $14 million to take on $3 billion of Soviet disinformation. And we won. And that was Irving Brown. Now, we need to be together. We need, to, as a Western group of people, not to get glee and joy out of the fact that America is in a mess over there, and that we have difficulties, and that we're losing American young men and women, and a lot of people who still continue to volunteer for police work, even though they know every one of them are targeted for death, we need to get together. And we need to fight terrorism all over this world. We might disagree on how best to do that. But I think uh, sometimes we love to sit back and criticize instead of actually being constructive and trying to find ways and methods that we might be able to have a more peaceful world, a world that works better, a world where we're all working against poverty, disease, hunger, and so forth. And if we don't do that, I guarantee you, it, Europe cannot sit back and just think it's all just going to go away. It isn't going away. So uh, I'm sorry to 
to uh, get so energetic about this, but the fact is I feel pretty strongly about it. I, there is no simple solution here. But there is a solution if we get together and we work together and we fight together and we do what we should. And that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that, uh, that we all have to agree on every uh, jot and tittle of uh, what goes on. I'm sorry, Dave. I know Listen, it's a little We long. thank you for speaking your mind. I, you know, this has been very useful because I think it really has illustrated the different voices in America. And there are very people who feel very passionately but have conflicting views. Very briefly, if there's a couple of microphones, who has a question here? Uh, yes, ma'am, if there's a microphone coming to you. If you please identify yourself, a brief question. Thank you. My name is Tina Alvi Hugenberger. I'm from Denmark, one of your coalition partners. I think. Um, we all agree that we have to fight terror. But the huge question is, how are we going to fight terror? Are we going to fight terror like in Iraq? I think it's a huge mistake. And you took the decision, and it has huge consequences for the rest of the world if we can't bring democracy to Iraq. And the big question is, how are we going to fight terror? by bombing or by creating decent life for those persons who are living in poverty without democracy and stuff like that. I don't think bombing is the way. Thank you. Senator? I hope bombing isn't the way myself, but, uh, uh, and, 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 and I'm not sure it's bombing that we're doing. We are trying to stabilize Iraq, and we, we hope that we can have a representative form of government there. It's a much bigger issue than just Iraq. You know, if we're successful, just think about this Western world, and those of you who are so critical, and I understand your criticism. I empathize with that criticism to a degree. By the way, my wife is from, her family's from Denmark. That doesn't mean that she doesn't recognize that we've got to do something rather than sit back and just exclaim, oh, well, let's be fair and wonderful to everybody. The fact of the matter is, is that, is that uh, we would be, love suggestions on how best to do this. But it's a lot bigger issue than just Iraq. If we are successful, now we've been successful in overthrowing a contemptuous, rotten regime that has killed hundreds of thousands of people and children, men, women, and children. That alone justifies to me what has been done. But there's a lot more that justifies it than that. But the fact of the matter is, is that if we are successful in Iraq itself, establishing a representative form of government, can you imagine the effect that might have on the whole Middle East where Third World War III really could erupt? Can you imagine if we don't handle this right, and we don't have the backing of our friends who have always been with us, and we've been with you at a great cost of American lives because of people who were fascists, just like these people are. If we're not friends and we don't work together, I guarantee you, we may not be able to contain the problems of the Middle East. But if we have a representative form of government in Iraq, we've got a real shot of having that spread. Because it's going to be successful if it will. And the problem is Iraq is between two corrupt regimes and some other corrupt regimes in the area that are consistently sending people in to disrupt Iraq. That's going to be a very difficult thing. But we have courageous people in Iraq. I look at Alawi attacked with an ax very close to death, the man's willing to risk his life every day, and all these police people over there willing to risk their lives every day. The voting that's going to go on on Sunday. Look at, our, look at Afghanistan. They said the same thing about Afghanistan. Today, it has come light years from where it was, in spite of all the tribal chieftains and all of the difficulties that they've had. And everybody was amazed at how people risked their lives to vote, and I suspect will be amazed by those in Iraq as well, against these people who would destroy you as well as Iraq. So let's, let's not, let's criticize constructively. Let's see if we can do things better. Let's, uh, 
But let's not just undermine the United States of America uh, that has never once had an imperialistic aim in all the things that we've done to help uh, our Western friends uh, in this world. Thank you. There's a question here. I'm uh, Ray Suarez from Public Broadcasting in the United States, and I watched very closely the analysis after the election and saw repeated uh, several times the idea that one of the great gifts to the Bush campaign uh, came not from any efforts of Karl Rove or the candidate himself, but from Mayor Gavin Newsom of San Francisco. Uh, the gift, the unilateral decision to allow gay marriage in San Francisco, which uh, took away any effort or negated, neutralized any effort that John Kerry may have made uh, to run uh, in, on faith and values kinds of issues. I'm sure you've seen that analysis, uh, Mayor. And, and heard it, to hear uh, and, and I, I'd, I'd like to hear what you have to say on that, and also, Mr. Sweeney, uh, whether those kinds of issues uh, successfully drove a wedge uh, into union efforts to run the campaign on an economic bread and butter uh, home issues uh, basis. Well, I think People have forgotten completely what happened on November 18, 2003, when the Massachusetts Supreme Court adjudicated in favor of legal same-sex marriage. I think people have forgotten that it was about that time when the cultural conservatives were putting a lot of pressure on the administration, and they were getting the response they wanted to hear, uh, supporting, or rather the president would support the constitutional amendment to ban gay uh, same-sex marriage. That was drafted and conceived of before I even got elected mayor of San Francisco. I think people forget that there were, a, there were legal marriage during the Democratic Convention with the Massachusetts Liberal uh, at would have been the focal point of the Democratic Convention had it not been for the fact, in many respects, we took a lot of steam out of Massachusetts. We humanized the issue. A lot of the consternation, the negativity happened in February, and it didn't happen as much in May. And having been to the convention, and certainly iced out of the convention appropriately, I guess, uh, I was certainly around listening and talking to people. And gay marriage, you know, the world didn't come to an end. The Red Sox still played good baseball, won the World Series. Uh, you know, marriage as an institution didn't come to an end either. And Massachusetts and the convention went forward uh, quite appropriately without this being a dominant issue. Uh, so no, I don't think that was the defining issue. Uh, certainly, for those that disagree with me, it exacerbated their anger, frustration, and their core beliefs, which they probably had already. But I just challenge you on this. If the Democratic Party can't stand on the principle of equality, then what's the point of winning? If the Democratic Party can't stand up and say the Constitution, the full promise of the Constitution cannot be afforded for every American equally, then we have no right as a party, have no moral authority. And so for those Democrats that think civil unions is good enough, how dare they suggest that when civil unions is separate and simply unequal? I feel very strongly about this because party, my party is about civil rights, human rights, women's rights, and from the perspective of gay and lesbian movement, I think I think what I did was long overdue and should have been done decades ago. Can, can I just push that a little bit farther away, right, if we might? Barney Frank, who's here, Democratic congressman from Massachusetts, openly gay, has his partner here, has argued strongly that the country was moving toward a greater embrace of homosexuality, a greater respect for, uh, uh, and, and in a very positive direction, and he regrets that this issue was put to the voters at the time it was. He thought it was premature. It forced voters to make decisions that it would have been better left not pushed, that it would have been more progress had there not been this rush, had there not been a, some, some, something like what happened in San Francisco, that gays actually would have, over the long haul, would have gained more from that. You just don't uh, buy that analysis. Yeah, That's I, also the analysis of the mayor of Providence, who's yeah, openly gay. Hey, I, you know what? I, and I have great respect for Barney Frank. He has none for me, and he's made it clear in ad nauseum publications. But I find that almost offensive. I mean, the notion of history as a guide suggests that's exactly what was said during the Civil Rights Movement. That was precisely what was said to Dr. King. Wait almost always means never was his response. In any social justice movement in our nation's history, this was always the argument, not 
this time, sometime later. The fact is, the same arguments were made when we were denying interracial marriage in America. I mean, the fact, you know, I hope you guys realize, this great democracy, with all the morality in the world we're trying to force upon countries around the world, and it's my kind of morality by and large, but we denied interracial marriage until 1967 in 16 states. Blacks couldn't marry whites. And the same arguments that were being used against interracial marriage are being used against the gay and lesbian community. And now it's being used by members of our party that represent the gay and lesbian community. Barney Frank, with respect, you're wrong, and I'm saddened by that because I have great respect and admiration for so many of his great accomplishments. Uh, Ray Suarez put that question as well, I think, to you, John Sweeney. Did you have a follow-up, Ray? to be called faith and values issues, um, neutralize uh, unions' attempts to run the election on the basis of bread and butter and uh, home economic issues? Well, I think we've seen that the uh, faith and values issues certainly uh, were influential in the, uh, in the election campaign. And uh, uh, the labor movement is a very diverse organization. We have, uh, we have members who have different positions on all of these issues. Uh, but it was very hard uh, to uh, get the message out on the basic issues of jobs and health care and the bread and butter issues, as you call them. Um, take Ohio as an example. Um, I, John Glenn and I were with uh, John Kerry in Akron, Ohio on Labor Day weekend, a rally of 20,000 people. Uh, Ohio is one of the hardest hit states in terms of the loss of jobs uh, and outsourcing of work. And uh, we saw Kerry uh, work the line after his speech, and these two young men came up. They had Bush t-shirts on. And so uh, Glenn and myself stood there to watch and see what the reaction was going to be or what the dialogue was going to be. And these two guys, all they wanted to talk about was, um, was these uh, faith and values issues, um, and it wasn't just one issue. Um, and yet they were, uh, they were affected by the uh, economic uh, situation in Ohio. Uh, neither one had health care in the jobs that they were working. Um, I'd say from the way they described their jobs, they probably were making maybe twenty-five dollars or $30,000 a year. And yet, um, to try and get them to focus on their job, their health care, um, their economic issues was very difficult, so there's no question about it. These issues played uh, a major role in the election. But this was in addition to the national security and the war. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We could clearly go on, there, uh, and there are many more questions, uh, because there's still more puzzles. But the, uh, can we thank the panel for helping to enlighten us on those? Thank you both. <laughs>